Um, you know, we all go through trials and events in our lives. We don't always understand why. I'm thankful that um, James tells us in the Word that the things that we count as uh, troublesome, they all work and that they we are to consider them joy. And I'm thankful to know that Psalm 139 tells us that there's nothing that comes our way that God has not appointed. And I know for a fact, and you do too, that there's not an appointment that God will make that he doesn't show up for. Very thankful to know that. And as we think about uh, Psalm 23 and the shepherd and how he goes with us through the valleys, through our temptations, through our trials, I'm grateful to know that even though I don't know down here always the purpose behind everything that comes my way, whether I know it now or on the other side in glory, I know that the shepherd has held my hand and he has a point of view that I don't. My thoughts are not your 
have so much talent around here, um, so many people who are willing to step out in faith and uh, use, use their gifts. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Dear Lord, we ask that the words that are spoken here this morning would be your words and that you would prepare us, that you prepare our hearts and minds to receive it, Lord. Um, you know, we all carry into the stress and strain and worries. We, we carry in so much sadness this morning for Eloise. But Lord, help us to see the light of the word um, that you gave us and that uh, how it is a, a lighthouse in this world for us. That it is a beacon for uh, those of us uh, who are going through trials and suffering. Thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was going to preach on one thing and now it's been shifted around with all that's going on. Um, you know, uh, when we sit here and try to make sense of all that's gone on um, with Eloise this past week. Um, her services will probably be at the end of the week, probably maybe Saturday, so it depends. They're getting ready to meet with Oates and Nichols uh, tomorrow, and, um, uh, and I'll be preaching her, her service, and so uh, hopefully you will all be able to come to, you know, to be a part of that. The... Uh, Today, I want us to turn to John 21 because this is, this is the way that I feel today and it's the way that I believe that Eloise feels today. And it is, remember, I want you all to remember about what Paul told us in terms of our lives. Is that he says that to be absent from the body, you might know this verse, to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. So that means when we leave this body as Christians, we are immediately with the Lord. I want, I want to be real clear on that because it gives us such great hope and encouragement because of all of the uncertainty that goes along with, with dying and death. So if we turn to John 21, this is after Jesus was resurrected. And uh, I want you to really, um, I want you to know who Jesus is. I want you to know what kind of God he is for us, for our sake. And so it says, after these things, I'm beginning in verse 1, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, or doubting Thomas, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said, it. Why, do you, why do you think he went fishing? Why do you think he did that? This is after Jesus' crucifixion. And I'm thinking that probably he's blowing off steam. Or some of us, we do, let's just keep busy and we won't think about what's going on, right? Because you know what he did. He denied Christ on three occasions. And so he's saying, let's go fishing. He'll take our mind off things. Let's just do something, you know, so that you know, we're busy. But then also, it's a positive thing. I want us to see that because fishing makes him money. It is what he does for a living, and it is what he's good at, um, but it will help their business. It means life goes on, and that, it's not a, that is not any kind of denigration to Jesus whatsoever. It is that we have to or we won't be able to feed our kids if we don't go fishing. So, so keep that in mind. But I think it's mostly just to, to – it's a bright spot. It's something that they enjoy, um, enjoy doing. And it says, uh, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. Uh, they, it says, they went out and immediately got into the boat and that night caught nothing. The guy yesterday, Lieutenant Colonel Glenn Myers, that spoke at the Rotary Club parade that was in Riverwalk Park yesterday. There were several hundred people there. And Jill did an awesome job singing the national anthem. And it was, it was fantastic. But the, the real bright spot of that day was Glenn Myers because he was in the Air Force, shot down in North Vietnam, and was held POW for over five years, uh, prisoner of war. And when he got up and spoke, the first thing out of his mouth was, I would not have survived without community. I would not have survived without the men and women that were going through it with me that were also POWs. And so... For us, when we, have, when we experience something like losing uh, our best friend Eloise, is that, man, are, shouldn't we be praising Jesus that we have, everybody look that way, and everybody look this way, right? 
right? Just to kind of look at each other and say, man, I'm thankful that I have my brothers and sisters. That it wasn't right, right? You guys looked at the walls. I'm sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but you look at each other, and I want you to be rejoicing that you have one another to go through this with, right? You have somebody that's here to put their arm around you. You have somebody to say, uh, it's going to be better tomorrow. You have somebody that can point you to scriptures as Jenny was sitting here reciting from Isaiah or from the 23rd Psalm. Right? We're, we have each other, and as Christians, we're called to build one another up. As Cumberland Presbyterians, we cook for one another in those times. Right? That's what, that's what we do is to try to, you know, I want you to... I want you to know how much I love you. I brought you a casserole. I brought you right in, in the time that you're grieving. And so he's there and he's going by himself and all the other guys go, no, we'll go with you. And it's not because they're sitting there going, man, Greg, I hope I catch a big one today. Right? It's not, they're not doing that. They're just going with him because they know how he feels. And they're friends. And sometimes, especially guys, we just go and we sit with one another and it's friendship and we don't have to say a word. We sit in that fishing boat all day long. And it's just great to be out on the water or out on the golf course or wherever we're going. And it's just nice to have somebody there with us. And so he's, he's there. They're going with him. And, uh, but it says they caught nothing. And by the way, that's not much fun to go fishing and not catch anything. It says, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. They're, they're way out. It says, then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the other side, on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord, exclamation mark. Now I'm going to stop there because that next line is so very, very important. Guys yelling from the shore. Now, if James and Connor and I are on a boat and we're fishing and fishing and our arms are sore because we haven't caught anything, you know, we've just been casting, 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 and a guy from the shore says, hey, take your boat right there and throw in. Well, if we've been doing it long enough, we might be willing to go, okay, out of humility, we might go, couldn't hurt anything, we can caught anything up to this point, right? And they go right over there, and then it's one right after the other, they're catching it. Well, that's what they did is that they're sitting there and the guy goes, cast your net on the other side of the boat. This scene has already happened before. Four, by the way, early on in the ministry, he's calling the 12. And they cast, and they can't pull the net in. There's so many fish, they can't pull the net in. Now, why do you think that was the case? Why do you think that Jesus did that for them in that moment? And by the way, what a powerful God that can control the fish and go, hey, you guys come over there. Come over there. There you go. Huddle up right there. Right in the net and pulled in. And then when they do that, and the, the nets are so full that they can't even pull it in, it's John that goes, oh, I, I've seen this before. I remember this. That's Jesus on the shore. And because, you remember it says early on in the Gospels, here, here you have Peter, and he's sitting there, and he's cleaning nets, and Jesus comes over. He goes, hey, can I use your boat? You put out a little bit here, and uh, let me teach from the boat because the crowds are so big. And Peter's like, I'm serious. I think he was just, I, I think he was worn out. He'd been all night fishing. They hadn't caught anything. They're cleaning the nets and Jesus, and he goes, because you're asking Jesus, I'll do it. And so they go out in the boat for a minute. Jesus teaches. He teaches the great crowds. And then Jesus said, let's go for a boat ride and get some fish. And they're like, we've been out on the boat all night. We haven't caught anything, Jesus, but because you're telling us to, we'll be glad to. And they take the boat out. He goes, throw it out there. And they haul in this huge load of fish. And that's early on in that three years of ministry, right? And so here they are, and this is after Jesus has been crucified, after he's been resurrected, and John goes, hey, this has happened before. This is Jesus that's on the shore. And at that moment, look what the next line says. It goes, it says, uh, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. Peter, the guy who's holding, you know, I'm imagining he's got the Captain Jack Sparrow wheel up there, you know, he's, he's directing the boat where it's supposed to go, it's probably just a rudder on the back, but I don't know that, right? And he's the guy that's the head of the operation, he's the chairman of the board, he's the lead fisherman, and he goes, see you fellas, and jumps into the water. As they're pulling in this big load of fish, right, I mean, they're trying to get these 
I mean, this is dollars. This is, you know, and that's not the reason that Jesus gave it to them. But for them, it's an important thing. Just like getting in the hay or taking in the harvest. I got to get this done. This is something important right here. And Peter jumps in the water, starts swimming away. And they're like, number one, you're supposed to be, you're back here with the rudder or the wheel. What are you doing, Peter? And why aren't you helping us pull this in, you know, because this is important. And he doesn't care about anything but what? Getting to Jesus. Getting to Jesus. That's the only thing that matters to him right then. And that exuberance, I imagine that Eloise, when she passed, now y'all remember when Eloise would come in, it, it, it's like me getting up in the middle of the night when I go to the bathroom. And when I get up in the middle of the night, I try to be real quiet, and every bone in my body cracks and creaks when I go to the bathroom. It's like, <laughs> like this, and Jill's like, come on. Because that's the way when Eloise would come forward, she's like, well, my elbow's hurting today, my knee's hurting today, my back's been bothering me, I'm having some digestive issues I've got. And I mean, and she wouldn't do that just to tell you a long list. She'd just say, this is what's hurting today or whatever. And I imagine that when she passed, she dove in the water and swam for shore because she saw Jesus. And I mean, in those moments, in that particular moment, as a Christian, there's nothing better than running to Jesus. Nothing better that he's waiting on the shore for you because we miss that. Sometimes we go, yeah, um, I get eternal life. That's great. That's awesome. When I become a Christian, I get eternal life. You know, and I was like 11 when I got saved. Jill was like six. And so when you're 11, 12, 13 years old, they go, you got eternal life. And you go, great. I'm not going to die for like 60, 70 years. But, uh, you know, right? We miss that. And in that moment, just that ever, everlasting eternal life and Jesus standing on the shore going, welcome home. And in that moment, Eloise is not looking back at us. She's, it's not that she doesn't love us or any of that kind of stuff, but she's with her Savior in heaven forever. And there's just absolutely, Paul says the words, it's beyond what you can imagine, right? And so for us, we need to understand, oh my goodness, she's going to leave a hole in this church and in her family and in Columbia. And she's going to be, you know, amazingly missed. But what was in Eloise's best interest? Oh my goodness. With all, she, she said, she told me about a month ago, she goes, I'm not getting any younger, 83 years old. You might ought to start looking for somebody else. And I said, the woman at Mount Pleasant is 91. What are you talking about, right? I said that to her. And then she's like, I know, I know, I know, right? <laughs> Nothing she enjoyed more than being here and playing for this, this church service and enjoying it. Flip back with me and look at, at uh, well, hang on. Let, let's not leave there. Hang on just a second. Let, let's, let's keep reading for just a minute. I don't want to leave there until we see this. It says, uh, verse 9, but the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Yeah, don't leave those fish behind, right? Don't do that. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Which again is for a fisherman is a huge blessing because they have to repair those nets. Okay? That's that's their livelihood or those nets. It wasn't broken in the midst of that other miracle. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of them, uh, none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord. And he said it three different times, Jesus asking him that question. And the reason is, is because he's denied Christ. And what, what do you think he's carrying around? What do you think Peter is carrying around with him ever since the crucifixion, ever since Jesus was on trial? He denied Christ three times after saying, there's no way I would deny you, Jesus. No way. No way that's ever going to happen. And he does it, right? He denies Christ three times. And in fact, the third time he curses about it. I don't even, right? You know, I don't even know that guy, right? He's carrying that guilt around with him. He watched his Savior get nailed to a cross. He watched them put the sign up above him. He watched them, you know, spit on him and mock him. They, he watched all of that in full view. 
and it carries around every single day from that moment on that guilt that goes with that. And in our lives, we get put through the ringer. We have all of this stuff that happens to us in our lives, and we feel we carry it around with us, sometimes as a badge, sometimes as, you know, hey, this is something awful that's happened to me. And in that moment, Jesus says, do you love me? And he takes the time to reconcile people. He didn't say, you know, you deserve to carry that around the rest of your life. You know, after you abandoned me three times, you deserve what you, you know, what you're feeling right now. That guilt, you know, that, that suffering that you're going through, that's probably something you need. Okay, he doesn't do that. He says, before I got it, before I'm resting, you know, ascending to heaven to my Father's right hand, I want to make sure you understand something, Peter, that I love you, and I want you to know what you're supposed to be about, and I want you to know that I forgive you. I want you to know that in the midst of that, right, that, that I'm offering you my love, even in spite of who you are. And that's, that's who Christ calls all of us. He says, I don't want you to go be perfect and then come to me. I want you to come to me, and I'm going to walk with you and help you to uproot those sins out of your life, but they're not in your best interest. He says, I'm going to love you in spite of who you are and the way you act sometimes. And so here we are, and Peter is, is getting asked in front of all the other disciples, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? And he, he says, absolutely, Lord, absolutely, Lord. Let's, let's look at go to, go to Luke 7 with me. I want you to see, see this, and I want, you to, I want you to know how good Jesus is, how good God is in the midst of all. Look at verse 11, 7 11. Your lucky numbers of the day. Luke 7 11. So the doctor writing traveled with Paul, wrote the Gospel of Luke. Now it happened the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him in a large crowd. So he's part of the parade. That's, what, that's what's going on. It's coming to town. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. I don't want you to miss this for a second, is that Jesus is traveling with an entourage. Remember he said that there's a bunch of people that follow me around going, oh, do another miracle, do another, oh, oh, that was good, do another, do another. And they're not believers, they're just following him around to watch what goes on. And he even turns to some of them and he goes, the only reason you're here is you're going to get another meal. You know, that, that, like feeding the 5,000, feeding the 4,000. And so Jesus has got this crowd that's following him as he goes from place to place. And he's got a parade of his own. And then here comes a funeral procession. And Jesus stops the parade, his parade, to let the funeral pass. That's one thing about Columbia that you'll notice right away. It's different than most other places is that when a funeral comes through, I don't care how many cars are there, everybody pulls to the side and nobody moves until that final police car goes by. But Jesus stops his ministry in the midst of this. Now, let's, let's take that with a grain of salt for a second. He doesn't stop his ministry, but he stops the parade. He's standing there, and here comes the coffin down. That's the way that I imagine it. It probably wasn't a coffin at that time. I don't know. But he comes down, and this boy is in this coffin, and the grieving mother is coming by. And Jesus just reaches out his hand. Now, why get involved? Why get involved? Why stand on the shore and yell at Peter and the other disciples? Why, why even get involved? You know, where were they when I was getting crucified? Those guys weren't around. They abandoned me. Why stand on the shore and yell for them and get them to come eat breakfast and get find forgiveness and healing and wholeness again? Jesus is standing there and the funeral's going by and he reaches out his hand. He gets involved and he touches that coffin and the boy sits up and he's restored to his mother. Let me say this. I think the reason he got involved is he looked into the eyes of the mother that was walking by, and she's grieving. She just says she's crying, weeping, and his heart was broken. He said, oh, look at how much she loved him, how much she cared for him. She wanted more time with him. He intervened and touched the coffin. The boy sits up and is restored to his mother. And I guarantee you, all of us sitting here today, at some point in this next week, Eloise's coffin is going to get carried into this place by pallbearers who love and respect her mightily. And if Jesus was here, you would be going, touch the coffin, Jesus. Touch, touch that coffin. Restore her to us. We loved her so much. Restore, restore, 
get involved. Please, Jesus, do that. And I will be going. Please, Jesus, don't touch her. Please don't touch her eyes. Because she's so much better off. It's better than she could ever imagine where she is. She lived 83 years, and she was a bright lighthouse for all of us, teaching us how to live as Christians. She jumped in the water, and she swam for shore because Jesus was standing there with his hands wide open. Let's pray. Dear Lord, it, we can't fathom how much you love us. You love us in opium dens and crack houses, houses of ill repute, in business meetings, in the darkness of our bedrooms, in our businesses, wherever we are. You, you love us in spite of ourselves. And you're constantly calling us out of that darkness into the light. And Lord, there are those, and uh, you know, the Bible assures us you know, there's a wide road that's headed to destruction and there's a narrow road, and you say, few people find it. But you're constantly calling to both roads. You're constantly saying, come and follow me. Find the light. And Lord, those that take hold of your hand, we are assured of so much. We're assured of heaven and eternal life. We're assured to be loved by a Savior. You, you tell us in John 14 that you go to prepare a place for us and that there are many mansions in heaven and all, you know, where no tear will fall, as you tell us in Revelation. There's no crying or sadness. And Lord, we take hold of that and we are just blown away by your love and grace and mercy. And as we live our lives, we cling to those promises that you give us in Scripture. We put the, the teachings into place in our lives and we see blessing and we try our best to point people to you. And we're thankful for Eloise because she did that for all of us. She was constantly pointing people to Jesus. And so today as we worship you, we are thankful to have gotten to know her. We're thankful on this Independence Day that uh, we're talking about a hero of the faith and um, that the words that were spoken Friday to her were well done. Good and faithful servant. And we pray all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. As Jill and Sila come forward to lead us in our, our concluding song, we're going to sing, I've decided to follow Jesus, uh, number uh, 602. And if you feel led to come forward, I will be here to pray with you about anything that's going on in your life, any situation that you have going on. But I can also, if you're willing to rededicate your life, to put one foot in front of the other towards Jesus, we can start that with a prayer here today. Maybe you want to join the church, whatever it might be, as we stand and sing together when you come. I have
Um, we were supposed to have basketball basics next Saturday. In fact, we handed out some flyers at Vacation Bible School about that. We're going to postpone that uh, because we don't know when Eloise's service is going to be. We want to make sure that the calendar is open for whenever they need to use the church. Um, and uh, so be aware of that, and I'll make sure that it gets taken off of her church sign, which it is right now. Um, and uh, But anything that anybody needs to say before we leave here today, I mean, I'm not, I'm just giving that opportunity. It was kind of the Lord that led me there. Okay. Would you sing with me number 343? We're going to sing the first verse of Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved 